Hello there and welcome to another episode of Showcase. The Arab World Institute in Paris has been working to spread knowledge about cultural and spiritual values for more than four decades. Now, for the first time outside of France, it is holding an art exhibition to provide people the artsy Arab perspective. Inside Rabat's Mohammed VI Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, one of the major museums in the Moroccan capital, 116 art pieces are on display. They reflect modern techniques, styles and more importantly, the way how 16 Arab artists pay tribute to their roots. This exhibition is very important, not just for, the, uh, um, for Morocco, but also for everybody, because it shows the strengths uh, and the quality of the Arab world artists. Uh, we can see that after this colonial period, donc all those artists affirm themselves uh, in very different ways. Uh, through abstractions, because they wanted to create new links with their own heritage, with their own traditions, with their own hopes. And what we see, in fact, belong to the global art history. The modern collection spanning from 1945 to the present includes paintings, sculptures and photographs. And the artists hail from Morocco and neighboring Algeria all the way through to the other regions such as Egypt, Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. It is part of the responsibility I have today to promote all the works by Moroccan and Arab artists. It means paying tribute to these artists who are now starting to become recognized. It gives me great pleasure, joy and happiness. And by offering visitors a chance to explore Arab modernities, it's hoped that this exhibition in Morocco will spread that joy to the entire region. The first ever Andy Warhol exhibition in Saudi Arabia has opened in the desert town of Al Ula. It is a part of the second annual Alula Arts Festival, an initiative to help put Saudi Arabia on the art map. The mirage-like building of Maraya in the Saudi desert is hosting some 70 pieces by Andy Warhol that zero in on the late artist's fascination with celebrities. The vibrant show titled Fame, Andy Warhol in Alula also aims to capture the change that has taken over the country. Uh, Warhol grew up uh, through a time of radical change in America in the 1950s and 60s, uh, a time of uh, a completely new, vibrant, new youth culture. Uh, and he recorded that and reflected that. Right now in Saudi Arabia, we're in a time of great change and great transformation where culture and art is at the heart of the change that's happening in this country. It's a very exciting place to be uh, right now. The exhibition is part of Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 initiative, which focuses on diversifying the nation's economy. And a part of the strategy is a focus on art. We're looking at a creative renaissance that is happening in Saudi. You know, we're going to look at you know, that era of the 60s back in the US and the world, and now we're looking at this era in Saudi and across the region, how we're pushing those boundaries and how we're trying to have that kind of like movement in place. And this is what we're witnessing here today with everyone. Apart from the famous pop art portraits, the exhibition also features screenings from Warhol studio and his Silver Clouds installation of helium-filled balloons. Outside the venue, a separate exhibition presents the 100 best Arabic posters, a collection influenced by the same elements of Warhol's time. So looking at the pop culture movement in the 1960s and, you know, Warhol being a kind of like a designer, a graphic designer of some sort back in the day, you can see that, you know, the influence over time and the colors over time and the pop culture that stemmed from the era still being kind of like trajected. Um, and this is where we saw the direct relevance in, in the posters that we see here today in the exhibition. 
The organizers are looking to further extend Warhol's legacy by reaching new audiences. Various talks about the artist and screen printing workshops will continue along with the show until May 16. Real estate prices in the UK are driving people to come up with alternative living methods. No, not flat sharing with others, but using dumpsters for accommodation. At least that's what Londoner artist Harrison Marshall did to protest against soaring rent bills. Rent fees in London went up by 17% last year. And artist Harrison Marshall felt the need to make a statement. So he moved into a waste container. An arts charity provided him the land. And Marshall spent around nearly $5,000 to renovate this dumpster in South London. This is where I sleep. At the moment, he has his own bed chambers. So this is the main living space. A small kitchen. And a garden with a portable lavatory. I was doing some work abroad and I was moving back to London and had to start that kind of dreaded hunt for a room. And as was the case with thousands of people across the city and across the country, the prices had gone crazy, you know, rent was mad. And even if I found somewhere that was in my price zone, then there'd be a hundred other people also looking for that room. To make his environment feel more homely, Marshall fitted the accommodation with essential services. Now I do finally have electricity so I can cook. I've got a heater, I've got a dehumidifier because the condensation was starting to become a little bit of a problem. Um, and then in terms of a toilet, I've got the port in the corner of the site. And if you think living in a dumpster gets in the way of socializing with the neighbors, well, think again. All the neighbors are amazing, actually. They're super friendly. Everyone's very supportive. I've got you know, neighbors coming and bringing homemade meals, or if they see me doing anything in the garden, they'll come and help out. Um, so that's, that's a massive bonus to the whole project, is just that this area seems to have a really good community. The rental market may be inspiring people to come up with radical art statements like this, but it seems even then it's possible to make a connection with the community. Maybe fellow Londoners can relate to Marshall's situation after all. Everything Everywhere All at Once blends fantasy, drama, comedy and sci-fi in a pretty absurd way. But the film has raked it in at the box office, which has left even its costume designer scratching her head. Here's why. Mrs. Wang. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? I am paying attention. Everything Everywhere All at Once tells the story of a Chinese-American couple who run a laundromat but have a hard time paying their taxes and understanding their teenage daughter. The film goes into this Sunday's Oscars as a frontrunner with 11 nominations, including for Best Picture. Its costume designer Shirley Kurata is also up for her first Academy Award. She says she's honored but also surprised. I, I think none of us anticipated any of this. Um, we were just hoping that the movie would get done and that it would maybe make it to the theaters and people would like it, but we never expected it to make it all the way to the Oscars and be nominated for Best Picture. So, um, you know, it came as a surprise, but a, a very, very, you know, happy thing, you know, for all of us. It turns out that the movie spanning multiple universes was a hit at theaters. And Kurata's stylish looks also popped off the big screen and many fans dressed like the film's characters on Halloween. 
but Kurata says her entire budget was more or less the equivalent of one marble costume. We didn't have the time or the budget. You know, I only had a month and a half to prep this movie, which is very short. And uh, my budget was very, very limited too. So um, unfortunately, I didn't have the, the budget to be able to, you know, sketch something, make everything from scratch. You know, I could make some things, but um, I had to, you know, choose like what I could make because that cost more money. Krata says she knew she wanted to be a designer since she was just a little girl. After completing her education in Paris, she worked as a stylist for films as well as music videos and commercials in the US. And despite having worked with stars such as Billie Eilish and Pharrell Williams, she says she is still a bit stunned by how Everything Everywhere All at Once became a box office hit. She's not sure if she'll win an Oscar come Sunday, but for her, the film itself is already a roaring success. Their emotions. Younger generations often overlook traditional crafts. That's precisely the problem an Emirati artist is working to solve. And she does that by revealing the unheard stories behind a historic craft. Tully is a textile tradition which has its roots in the United Arab Emirates. It's produced by weaving several cotton threads to form colorful shapes with symbolic meanings. Mostly done by women at home, it's a craft that takes time. And that poses a problem, as mass production of textile has made this tradition fade into the background. But Emirati artist Sara El Hayal wants to keep the spirit alive. She has visually documented the stories of the craft's women practitioners and put them on display alongside various tali patterns, both old and modern. Her installation, Tali Currency, shows there is more to this art than meets the eye. It's basically about trying to archive Tali in a new way. So Tali is usually seen as a handcraft and it's recognized as a handcraft. However, through my research, I realized that it's so much more than just the uh, handcraft here in the UAE. It has a lot of rich history and stories. And I like to see it as the earliest form of entrepreneurship for female here in the UAE since it was woven with actual silver. So it was treated almost as a currency between females. So this whole project is titled Tali Currency based on that fact. In the end, El Hayal hopes her work inspires people to claim their heritage. My aim with this project is to connect the younger generation with the older generation through creating pattern and textile so that it can be worn and bring back life to those stories and be reintroduced into female medicines. El Hayal's work is not the only one to focus on Emirati heritage. At this year's Sika Art Festival, Fellow homegrown artists also covered similar territory, such as raising awareness on the architectural developments in the region by painting murals. And a good percentage of artists were women, making the 11th edition of the festival a platform of gender diversity as well as socially conscious art. The latest project of Russia's State Hermitage Museum lies at the intersection of science and art. The institution has brought in botanists to look at both art and world history from a new angle. The Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg is one of the largest in the world of its kind and is home to centuries-old art. Visitors come here to admire portraits of illustrious figures painted by some of the most skilled artists ever known. Though a new study by scientists from the St. Petersburg State University shifts the focus away from old celebrities, the Hermitage Garden Project instead examines how these paintings depict the natural world. In general, it's always very interesting to understand what is represented in the paintings. 
You are interested to see a horse, a bull, a dog, a cat. Why not plants? Artists painted not only petals, but they also depicted pistols, stamens. Some plants have the curvature of pistols. This curvature was reflected in the paintings. Botanists have analyzed more than 200 works from the museum's collection and presented them in an illustrated book. They say their research also sheds light on world history. What amazed me was the paintings depicted a lot of plants from the New World. For example, something was brought from the United States. It wasn't just silver, gold or precious stones. Seeds were also brought. By and large, the old world was enriched specifically with plants. The work has changed how even curators interpret the paintings they know so well. Now we art historians can't look at things without deciphering each flower. This part is done and whether we like it or not, we now write not just flower garland, but a garland of roses, a garland of bellflowers, etc. You immediately think of a symbol, what it meant for an era. No flower, no plant was depicted just for the sake of it. This isn't the first study at the Hermitage that focuses on details in paintings. A previous one had examined butterflies. But with so many more parts to explore, new studies might spring up in no time. The Cold War was much about secrets, with the East and West nations spending decades peeking above the Iron Curtain to pry into each other's covert missions and agents. Now, one of that war's best-kept secrets in Denmark has been revealed to the public. And for many, the timing is just right. This dugout, Regen Vest, has been in the sleepy Danish town of Oplev since 1968. Yet, until a few years ago, even locals had no idea. Today, it's been turned into a museum. We cannot ignore, for example, but when NATO Soviet build up of weapons in Angola. and the Warsaw Pact were locked in the Cold War, it was a top-secret nuclear bunker, reserved for the monarch and high-ranking officials. After the event of the Hungarian uprising and the Suez uh, incidents, the fear of a war in the center in, in Europe was very real. Uh, and at the same time, also the uh, nuclear bombs, and especially the hydrogen bombs, has evolved. And they were so devastating that you had to do something else than what you have done before. You have to think in another way. And one of the things that were a key issue was to keep governmental control into your country and to make places that could, as well as possible, protect the government against an atomic blast. With the capacity to hide 350 people, the bunker also had rooms for journalists, communications specialists, as well as workers to operate the machinery. Curators say this was the last bastion, and its abandonment for any reason would have also meant the end of Denmark as we knew it. And museum goers get to experience that base life for themselves, 60 meters under a chalk hill. You can see about everything here. And it, it is just as if they sort of left rooms when the Cold War stopped and then abandoned the place and went out. So you can see you have paper clips, paper, furniture. Well, food is not preserved here, <laughs> but, but all the plates and the cups and uh, it, well, everything um, carpets, uh, pillows, you name it. The museum is dotted with posters that warn against the dangers of nuclear arms. And as international conflicts divide the world once more, One year ago. curators say this bunker is more relevant now, with the Cold War feeling ever so close.
London's Hayward Gallery has opened an exhibition by British artist Mike Nelson. It is a collection of installations that present fictal worlds which look surprisingly real. Let's take a look. Mike Nelson's exhibition, Extinction Beckons, opens with a storage room that shows how installations look when they're just stacks of items. All of them have been scavenged by Nelson himself, and as is the case with any scavenged item, they each have a story. Well, this is a survey of the work of Mike Nelson, a British artist in his mid-50s. It's called Extinction Beckons, and that slightly ominous title gives you a clue that Mike's vision is at times a dark vision. There are things here that um, hint of disaster, decay, violence perhaps sometimes, and his world that he alludes to is very much a world of people who live outside the mainstream of contemporary culture. The real lifelike installations which look as though they were recently abandoned leave visitors with a feeling of being on a film set, as if action was just interrupted and everyone deserted the scene. And you wander from one location and environment to another. As you open a door, you go into another one. Um, and you have to invent the script for that film. There's no narrative, but every time you walk into one of those rooms, you feel like the people who were there have just left. And so in a way, it's a, it's a haunted house because they're the ghosts of all these people, whether they are laid off factory workers, Gulf War veterans, sweatshop laborers, gamblers, cultists. You'll run across all of them as you go through this exhibition. With references to science fiction, failed political movements, dark histories and countercultures, Nelson displays elements that stand out in an otherwise homogenized and globalized world of today. On the one hand, Mike is someone who looks at some of the darker sides of our society. Um, on the other hand, his work has a kind of ingeniousness to it. His, the way he puts objects together to create beautiful sculptures sometimes, or to create these completely lifelike environments. Um, and so it has that power of art to transport us and to kind of inspire our imaginations. This first major survey of Nelson's work, featuring what Hayward Gallery calls psychologically charged installations, will be on display until May 7. London's Satcha Gallery has filled its space with graffiti, street art and pop art. This new exhibition is called Beyond the Streets London and is not only on the walls but also on the ceilings and floors. Here's more. This glow-in-the-dark display is what American artist Kenny Scharf calls a cross between gallery pop art and street art. He named his work Cosmic Cavern. I thought the Kenny Scharf glow-in-the-dark room, which is a bit of a hard one to find because it's through some curtains, but when you get in there it's like you're in a different world and it feels like you don't, you're not in Chelsea or West London at all. Taking street art away from its natural habitat may seem strange, but the aim is to promote the creative journey artists make during their careers. People can say graffiti and street art should be in the streets and I absolutely agree with them. A lot of it should be in the streets. We're not here to just take the work that was in the street and put it on the wall, remove it improperly or anything like that. So many of the artists that work in the street or grew up working in the street or learned so many of their skills working in the streets have gone on to have incredible, illustrious studio careers. And we want to celebrate that. Sachi Gallery says the show is the most comprehensive street art exhibition to open in the UK. More than 150 artists have taken over the entire gallery. If I was to be a bit critical of it, I would say that it's quite hard to pull any themes out of the exhibition. It feels a bit incoherent and it's a bit all over the place, but maybe that's the nature of street art. It is that kind of vibrant, explosive, diverse scene and that you will never have a sort of coherent vibe to it. Beyond the Streets London is also a traveling exhibition that has previously been in Los Angeles and New York City. It will remain in London until May 9. 
That's it for this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. From me and the whole team here in Istanbul, thank you for watching and goodbye for now.